Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Intermillennium Media Project podcast, a podcast where we take a look at media from another time, a strange time called the 20th century. And we talk about it from a few different perspectives. Uh, My name is Matthew Porter, representing Generation X, born back in the 1960s, and watched way too much television and too many movies, uh, probably ones that I shouldn't have, back in the 1970s and 80s. And with me is... Ian Porter. I'm early 1990s and the representative of millennials in this scenario. I guess. I guess. I'm... Wherever that line is. Wherever that line is. And I'm here to see what in the world made my dad who he is. <laughs> <laughs> and he hasn't had a lot of choice in the matter. Great thing about having a kid is you get to put whatever you want on television. <laughs> really do whatever you need to to their minds. Oh, my goodness. So what we're talking about is TV, movies, comics, things that I enjoyed in my youth that I want to know, does this still hold up? How do I feel about it watching it decades later? And also... What I think of it, because that kind of changes what it could become. Could it be revived? Could it be rebooted? What have we got here? Or does it just still stand up on its own? It's amazing how many things do. Not as amazing, but it's just as interesting how many things don't. Yeah. (laughs) So this is the first actual episode of the uh, IMP podcast. And we're talking about something that is so very much of its time. The most 80s thing in the world, I The think. most 80s thing in the world. And that is the TV series Max Headroom. M- M- Max Headroom. <laughs> You've got to work on that, Ian. We've yeah. got to give you more coffee. You get that stutter <laughs> just right. Uh, yep. Got to get a little bit more in there. So, Ian, yeah, tell us about Max Headroom. We've watched a couple of episodes of that and basked in its glory. <laughs> and uh, for people listening to the podcast who are not familiar with the show, want to give a recap? In the distant, ruined age of the 80s, no one can zoom out on a camera. Uh, so our main character, Edison Carter, is a reporter for the giant news network that seems to control everything, or at least a major part of everything, because... Every episode, someone controls everything and kind of rotates. But he continually acts kind of awful, yet gets himself a story, which means people like him. He gets himself a head injury, and a guy, a young man who can't seem to figure out that graphical processing power is not the same as RAM speed, decides, I can scan a mind when I was impressed I could make a parrot about it. 20 minutes ago yeah but it's not like it was easy scanning a human mind took billions of bytes billions i say who could have that much storage (laughs) oh my goodness i'm imagining what would happen if you brought flash drive into this apocalyptic world (laughs) but he he bypasses a pair of nuclear incidents in the first episode just so that he can punch at his bosses edison's got a chip on his shoulder edison's made of shoulder chips oh yes this is it's called max headroom but it is so very much the edison carter show oh, it's it, the edison carter adventuring crusading like indiana jones as journalist in the near future absolutely in fact that's kind of how it's awesome edison carter is an awful guy you like Want to meet once, you might wind up in the end throwing a punch at him, but you'll be like, I met the guy, and then that's all you need. (laughs) He's not a guy I want to hang around with. He's a guy I want to shake hands once with and leave. (laughs) Yeah. Once you've had a chance to meet him, then any other time you encounter him, it's probably not good news. Exactly. (laughs) Like He leaves a trail of destruction literally in his wake, yet still somehow is our hero. (laughs) <laughs> and the entire time, our our title character, Max Headroom, bouncing from screen to screen and being annoying, is much more of a an oddly literal deus ex machina to the story plot. Something will be going wrong, and it'll be him, like, popping up, making bad, sometimes good bad, most bad bad jokes, Fixing the problem or, like, opening the door needed for our heroes. And then he just kind of leaves and gives you a tag at the end. He's not there until he's, like, needed. Right. He's... <laughs> it's probably a good thing. They use Max Hedrum rather sparingly in this adventure show. Absolutely. 
I think the problem is almost the fact that he's the name of the show. I I looked up other merchandise and such from this. Why was he the entire focus when the show knew better than to focus on him? <laughs> And that's a, a, a weird bit of the history of this show, how this character in this show developed. It was originally this strange celebrity talk show in mm. Britain, and this supposedly computer-generated character, Max Headroom, was the talk show host. And then they created a t- sci-fi, cyberpunk kind of TV movie to explain the backstory of this supposedly computer-generated character. And that was so interesting and got enough people's imaginations going that they brought it over to the U.S. and created this TV series all around, really, the journalist who provided the, the, the initial input information for this character of Max Headroom. And that well, the pilot that we watched is essentially a redo of the TV movie, explaining yeah. how Max Headroom came to be and who Edison Carter is. Uh, yeah, and... It's weird because the the setup, the world they built, is more interesting than the ori- origin point. I don't want a piece of merchandise with Max Headroom's face on it, but give me my Edison Carter action figure. Absolutely. I will buy that. I will go and buy the Chopper sen- uh, 7 playset to go with it. <laughs> I want th- Those are the things I need on a shelf, not a picture of the guy who fixes a problem by showing up and making a bad quip and leaving. Yeah. We've got plenty of those. We've got and so many of those. There was even a character in this who's talking about completing his uh, collection of He-Man and Master of the Universe action figures. And I was thinking the same thing. Forget about that. I want my uh, Edison Carter yeah. and Network 23 action figures. Uh, give us give us figurines of these characters. Give them uh, those like you can actually play a story with. The Mags Headroom merch will sit on the shelf. <laughs> you'll look right. at it. You'll think it said something you're slightly bothered by. And... You, you've got the character there, but there's not much else. Besides, everyone else has poseable arms and legs. <laughs> Max himself is making constant comments about the fact that he is nothing but shoulders and a head. And just to round out the recap of the story, going to this uh, pilot episode that we watched, mm. the first target of Max Headroom, uh, excuse me, the first target of Edison Carter, this crusading journalist, is his own employer, Network 23. Yeah, he, he spends all this time just to, like, punch his bosses, and it's it's about an advertising thing. I've got – my notebook only says here, insert YouTube ad policy joke. <laughs> I didn't think of one, but it's apt, so. Uh, yeah, if YouTube could come up with a, a way to impose – Blipverts on their viewers, I think they would. Yes, but at the same time, it's 2018 now, and Max Headroom is on YouTube in the form of how many different of these virtual... I'm I'm using my animated character as my avatar things. Like, let's be very honest here, and this is the, the sad truth we must admit. Max Headroom is Hatsune Miku's grandpa. Absolutely. And, yeah. yeah. Da- I don't think dad. I think there's a step <laughs> in between. But he's definitely the grandpa. And he's, I think you're right. he's there. And we've got to admit that to ourselves as a, as a people. Yep. <laughs> as far as the story, the pilot of, of Max Headroom revolves around Network 23's, you mentioned Ian, uh, the new advertising uh, concept of blipverts, mm-hmm. which are super compressed advertisements which are designed to give 30 seconds or 60 seconds of advertising in two or three seconds so that people don't have time to change channels. With the unfortunate side effect, extremely sedentary people, like those who watch a lot of television, are going to have their neurons excited to the point where they explode. So the network is literally killing people with their advertisements. And the network is torn between, we're going to lose our biggest corporate advertiser if we don't provide them with blipverts, versus... It's being challenged and exposed by the, – the lethality is being exposed by our top-rated journalist, Edison Carter. It's weird how it's all internal. The fact that if it was like the rival group and then he was getting pressure to, to go hunt this down and it was slightly shady because it's actually his boss is trying to get the upper hand by showing how bad their – rival network was but we're getting hints that the network he's working for is just as bad you'd have at least something to roll off of for later episodes you'd have something where it makes sense why he's going after them yeah it really is like like i'm gonna fight the man with everything (laughs) the man handed me in the most ridiculous way because it's a company like 
they're standing there saying we should stop hitting ourselves. We should stop hitting ourselves. And But it, it is a great example of the beginnings of the sort of 90s techno-utopia that we saw where – Greater access to technology and communications was going to make the world so much better because everybody could share the information they had. So the world of Max Headroom is still this network-oriented, a network in terms of TV network. Mm -hmm. This monolithic organization like Network 23 controls so much, but their control is slipping because of people like Edison Carter, because the technology that lets Edison Carter get out there and Mm -hmm. report – Mm-hmm. One of your favorite characters in the entire thing shows up mostly in the other episodes we watched. He's not in the main one, uh, Blank Reg. Oh, Blank Reg. And his, his little tiny van trying to broadcast his own thing, which is in some ways the best actual hint at what's there. Because it's it's like him and a small group of other people, uh, like his wife, Rick, who shows up, who really... Yeah. His wife, Dominique, and Rick the rickshaw driver. Rick the rickshaw driver. <laughs> so, like, we've got a small crew... They're individually uh, displaying stuff, and the few times we've seen anyone watch it, they've honestly found enjoyment of it, and he's mostly doing remixes of old video footage he's found. I can point to hundreds of YouTube channels (laughs) just like this. In some ways, Blank Reg was more of what things became than they expected because he was cobbling together this home network system and that was supposed to be the oh look at you you want to be like the big guys but they didn't realize no the big people are gonna like crumble into a pile of blank regs over time and that's kind of what we're getting at yeah yes and no i think you've got a point there blank reg anticipates a youtube channel yes whereas network 23 is like nbc universal uh comcast yeah giant media mega corporation even though they it sounds like they broadcast on a single network which is remarkable. And also, it's it, it's not a news network. One of the f- most fun things is in the background about all the other shows that Network 23 broadcasts. They've got, like, video medical diagnosis shows and all these bizarre entertainment shows. Lumpy's Proletariat, Proletariat yeah, for like, the, the Marxist fun lovers out there, I suppose. What, the fact that it is one network is almost amazing because in, in some ways – the 80s were worried that if we're thinking from the network perspective, people are going to change channel. And the response they thought was, we'll have to make people not change channel. The way the future figured out how to do that is be weird. If yes. people are going – are saying, what am I looking at? They won't move away. The world of Max Headroom would have never predicted an Old Spice ad. And that becomes this weird loop for it. Right. It is still so very centralized. Even big-time television, Blank Reg and Dominique's uh, channel, it's still broadcast from one place to a bunch of viewers. There isn't this network effect. There isn't this sense of everybody's audience and everybody is a broadcaster that we have today. It's just how big are you? Everybody's a, All the media is from a central broadcaster, and the only question is how big a central broadcaster are you? Mm-hmm. And... Network 23 is shown as we have our channel and we are desperately trying to make sure people don't switch away from our channel. And by the way, Network 23 is apparently a global channel. Yeah. This is still in a world where there aren't that many television channels. But today, instead, we get the approach of if people are going to change channels, we don't care if we own most of the channels. Yeah. And that's where you get an NBC Universal Comcast. You know, we don't care if they switch from NBC to Sci Fi Channel to something else if we own all the channels. Yeah. And they, they've got this like mono global setup. They've got here's the dad from Arrested Development and our British lady who comes in following around our one with our one intrepid reporter. And somehow these three are setting up the video for the one mega channel for a block of, like, an hour, I assume, that's that's getting this amount of views. There's actually, like, way more power in these people's hands than it looks at first. Right, and they've got money and equipment and resources behind (laughs) them to do this because they're programming this hour of television for 253 million, 300 million people. Yeah, I mean, we get we get in the first episode that someone tries, like, two different instances of people trying to take his camera from him. And we're learning this camera's got, like, infrared and all these features. This thing is is decked out. I mean, it, it's huge. It looks, he holds it like a bazooka, and it's one of these big cameras. And I'm, and I'm early on thinking, 
oh my goodness, you'd be you'd be amazed at an iPhone. And then later on in that same episode, it's like, wait, no, you wouldn't. That thing does how much? It's like <laughs> it's like helping her live decrypt a keypad because it can infrared the most pressed buttons. Right. Like, okay. The bulk actually works when you've got this amount of features, but we see, we see. So this ca- this camera that is actually impressive by our standards, people try to take from him, and he fights them off. And I'm thinking, okay, the camera's valuable. And then later episodes, they ditch the camera in like a trash can, and he keeps running. And we get a hint that, oh, be careful, a hand is more valuable if you die than <laughs> than like the camera would be. It's like, oh, wait a minute. He was just protecting him because he was going to get hurt if they took the camera. Right. And these people have got, they, they live in this strange, like, trash edges, mega city, but they've got cash on hand to toss these, like, ridiculous cameras aside at a moment's notice like that. There's kind of, there's either a discrepancy or an entire other, like, logistics angle that is staggering. Now, granted, these were pretty extreme circumstances under which they were ditching this camera. In one of them, Edison Carter was wrongly accused of credit fraud, which in this world is apparently a far worse crime than murder. It's capital crime. Yeah, my God. He's running for his life, and they can trace him through this linked video cam. So that's one reason they ditch it. And in another one, I think you were talking about, where there are the body harvesters who are bringing people to sell them at the body oh, yeah. banks. Yeah. And um, saying, you know, don't damage the hand. The hand is worth more than the camera. That's just one of the, even at the time when this was made, or in 1987, these cyberpunk dystopian tropes were sort of becoming a little bit tired, but they threw every one of them that they could into the Max Headroom world, and it works because it's so disjointed, we don't notice any lack of continuity. Yeah, it, it, it is homogenous in its lack of consistency in that, <laughs> in that strange form. It's also kind of funny, if you look at it, they've got... In the uh, the episode where they ditch the camera, he we've got Max Headroom and his girlfriend A7, the security uh, machine. <laughs> and in some ways, it's, you know, here's the product of the giant media corporation. And here's the computer that has uh, individual files of actions, like interests and location for all these different people. That's really what we've got now. This this strange child between our media and what you like, because the media is tilting itself to what you like. We live in the world of their child, Max and A7's kid. Yeah, you've got a good point. That's another sense in which things are not as monolithic as they were presented in this show things are more distributed we don't have one giant company that cont- controls everybody's security and everybody's credit rating and all these things but we have a few different companies that do this and they are all connected right so we see max headroom giving us a much more simplified prediction of the kind of things that we see today in identity theft. Oh, yeah. Your life has to be reconstructed because not one company is against you, but somebody has put the wrong information into lots of different places very easily. And that's part of the difference in that we have these interconnected networks that were not really anticipated by the people who wrote Max Headroom. Max Headroom assumes that to get to into something, you have to walk up and clip a wire to it. Yeah. And that is that is delightfully analog. And yet once they once they clip that wire on, they understood. Uh, I mean, they give you cheesy visuals. It's like we're going to crack through this security. Look at me play like asteroids on a like really strange like 3D display <laughs> effect. But. Once you get past that, like, layer of cyberpunk cheesiness and the the analog nature of it, the idea that once I'm in here, this is the part I have to do actually holds up. It, and that's the impressive part. It does. It is such an analog world that Max Headroom and that Edison Carter inhabit. There's There are computers, of course. Computers are important. But this is still when computers were still the province of this priesthood. Mm-hmm. They were these isolated, a little bit weird, extremely intelligent people who understood how to do all this computer stuff. Yeah. yeah. Everybody else was dealing with analog. They're dealing with analog cameras. They're waving around uh, micro Betamax or micro VHS tapes where all the important information is because it's all analog video. 
like you were saying, you, you want to change, move something, even something like a computer program like Max Headroom from one place to another, you've got to carry a box in there and clip it to something, and it can jump from one computer to another. Which, of course, has its monitors and its speakers and a battery pack inside. Just because Max has to be able to, like, yell clips <laughs> as they leave, they're not going to save power. They're going to let him burn that just to have his personality yeah. screaming out there. But yeah, that's a TV show aspect instead of a world aspect in that sense. There's a little bit of Krang in Max Headroom, too, isn't there? To somebody yelling from inside a little box? Yeah, there absolutely Don't you want to give him a robot to march around in? I kind of do. I... <laughs> I'm I'm imagining Max Headroom like infecting a Roomba, and just like running around the house making all these things. It's like, and I still figured out how to vacuum the floor. I'm great, <laughs> ain't I the best roommate? Yeah, there's there's a, there's a definitely a crossover comic potential there, and some kind of a convention involving Max Headroom and Krang and uh, Modok. Yeah. And I don't know who else, but we've got the police, literal talking head. The the <laughs> the League of Talking Heads. <laughs> right. We we've got a group here. One of the things I like about watching these 80s TV shows, even ones that are set in the future, like this one is in the future as seen from the 80s, is the fashion and the architecture and, you know, the haircuts. I don't know if we saw any in what we watched, but if we brought back some hairstyles from the 80s, I would be fine with that. I, I, oh, it's, it's hard to say. This is mid-80s, and they very, very well captured what I think mid-90s looked like in some ways, fashion-wise, but I don't know how well it translates forward. (laughs) In some ways, the part of the issue is that everything is so muted in the world of Max Headroom, and that's in part to make sure that when they do technology stuff, it can be bright and flashy and have the big colors. The fact that Max has this moving, colorful background is made all the more important when you haven't seen color in so long. Yep. And that, that makes it hard to say. I would rather bring in, like, Rick's glasses and some of the coats that I saw there than I would some of the hairstyles, but that's me. <laughs> that may be just because uh, this was from when I was in college, and, you know, I see some of these actresses in the very 80s hairstyles and say, hey, that's pretty. <laughs> 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 but it's surprising how much of the fashion actually holds up. You know, the pants are a little baggy, but they're, you know, ready for action for Edison Carter. He's got his leather jacket. and Yeah. Uh, he, he wouldn't uh, wouldn't seem out of place today. Uh, yeah, he, he'd, he'd raise a couple of, re- of flags just because, like, he needs a better cut T-shirt underneath the jacket. <laughs> he needs He needs a little bit of, like... A touch up, maybe maybe a better shampoo. Yeah, but he actually kind of fits. And if I were to see him, jacket and giant camera, walking down the street in the middle of Denver, I wouldn't think cosplayer. I would think like guy with a style who's not going to let you tell him no. In a way, I I, I like in some ways the the te- the the analog tech with them adds to that style and the fact that it is noticeable compared to the modern stuff is is nice and impressive it's not this hidden away compact bluetooth headset it's big old speaker if you see headphones at all it's big can headphones that's a style now that's something going for it you're right for somebody who wasn't going for that style edison carter would be so much more boring today it would be a guy in a hoodie walking around with an iphone and that would do all the stuff that edison carter can do walking around with his leather jacket and his cool pants and his uh his giant uh, video cam well, although yeah we'd need, even, a couple, he'd need a couple of iphones to be able to do that but yeah yeah i guess so and although the iphone could do a lot almost everything the video cam can do you can't really hit somebody with an iphone the way he he actually in the first episode there he really clocked one of these security guards with his video cam and now you would just get mad if you did that with an iphone edison, edison carter's fighting skills very wild between cuts one moment he'll decide to grab a okay why are there these statues of naked women in like classical style all (laughs) mining the research and development i've got a question for the interior designer but separately he decides let me grab this about person-sized statue and throw it on the floor that takes me like about a yard and a half of running distance closer to the guards that this is supposed to stop 
And then we see him start to bolt, and the guards literally step over it in one stride. <laughs> this was the most pointless statue knockover possible, and I don't know why Edison will do it. He and just he'll... hates those statues. Yeah, they, they, the statues. They are all over the uh, Network 23 offices, and he hates them. I don't know why. Yeah, but he, yeah. So he just like grabs one, tosses it over, wastes his time. It's like, you don't know how to deal with it in a fight. And then a moment later, he's there like, let me like trip and mid fall kick a guy down yeah and then like he he parries and clobbers a man with this video camera and i'm like okay you're actually good you're like i guess he's bad at ranged he's an awful ranged <laughs> combat i guess but he's yeah. good in a fist fight i don't know what to think of his skills Given what he has to deal with and the fact that he's always carrying that video cam, there should be some kind of a specific martial art oh, yeah. around close range combat in barren hallways using the video cam as a weapon. Yeah, it's kind and of. And he would be a master of it. It's like a much bulkier tanfa at that point. It's got this handle off to the side, it's large and kind of square, protruding <laughs> from the arm. We could actually possibly like look up some forms and get him like oh, yeah. an actual setup going. And those hallways and a lot of the architecture, again, it is so 80s. We've got these barren hallways illuminated. Obviously through a Venetian blind or some other grating to make make the lighting very dramatic with like classical sculptures just scattered at random. It's like everybody's living inside a, a Nagel painting, <laughs> which is like the most 80s thing. I've never done cocaine, but Nagel paintings always looked to me like cocaine must feel. Oh. And that's what half of the architecture yeah, here looks it, like. It doesn't matter what building. There's only two settings. There's either Nagel painting or there is brown pile of monitors there's only <laughs> two settings oh no there is a third there is theodora's apartment which is pink with lots of insubstantial seeming draperies and what looks like a vintage car halfway in the apartment yeah. i never quite figured that out it, it, it was like that that looked like someone was half trying to remember the room from a murder mystery right yes there there's like there's like all this waviness and the the car and the piano in the corner with the spotlight but in, like there's no bench for anyone at the piano i think it was just the piano I don't think I didn't there notice was a, that. I, I was too I, distracted I by the car that was driven halfway yeah. to the apartment. I think it was just for decorative purposes, what those would be. I'm not quite sure. Uh, the best part is that he gets into the apartment. She's not even there. She pops <laughs> up on six monitors. She's just like, like, I, uh, welcome to my apartment. It's not where I live. Yeah. Okay. I guess so. And that kind of brings me to the cinematography of this entire oh, thing. Oh, yes. This is a well-shot show about people who can't shoot video. <laughs> The actual show itself is wonderful angles, lots of use of the rule of thirds, great use of Dutch angles when they need the drama, but it doesn't lean on them. And then every single person we see use a camera in this entire show does not understand how to back away from the lens. <laughs> right. yeah. It is like the cinematography of the show is excellent. And then everyone else can't do what the show right. itself is doing. Yeah, Edison Carter, this award-winning video journalist who is broadcasting live and direct to 200 million people, which I'm guessing is more people than ever watched this TV series when it was on. Yeah. Yeah. But he looks like the worst YouTube ranter that you've ever seen. He's inches away from the camera. You can barely make out who he is because he's so distorted he's close to there and and and, and he leans it down so you're looking like not just at him but like up his nose a little <laughs> with the camera meanwhile the scene showing us him doing this is like back like three people distances it's got a slight tilt for the hallway to show us more of the distance give us emotion and feeling we've got characters reacting in the background to what we're seeing responding to the events even while they're not the central focus all of this and i like i want to flip who's where <laughs> right. i want i want to see the guy actually filming the tv show Filming the right, TV right. show in the TV hey, show. Excuse me, Edison, babe, could you just, like, swap cameras with this other guy? He seems to be... You, you, you can keep talking, but this guy knows how to use a camera. <laughs> exactly. It is... It, even in the production is very analog in this. Oh, yeah. Like, so much cyberpunk-inspired TV and movies, it owes a whole lot to Blade Runner in terms of the look. And the city that they show you, mm -hmm. it's this small section of city, and they evoke so much of the setting so well on this 
obviously very limited budget. Today, that would be a, a giant CGI city covering miles and miles and miles. Here, it's cardboard models and foam models of a few buildings. But the way it's lit, the way it's shot, the way they move the camera around that. One of the buildings has a giant monitor in it, which is, of course, just a tiny TV CRT that they put into the model itself to show zigzag ads. Exactly. And it, it's this weird blend of, like, I look at it, I'm like, wow, there are CGI, like, city flybys that look faker than this. And here's this opening view of this city that's excellently done. And it lands in this strange, uncanny valley between that CGI with their little TV in there and, like, the Gizmonics Institute yes. bit from Mystery Science Theater 3000. Yeah. It's got that cardboard, plasticky model shine that you can't get rid of purely. So there's part of your brain saying, yeah, that's fake. It's fake, and I can see the plastic glue. And the other half of it's saying, this city looks so real because I can see how, to, like, this place is falling apart. Right. And if you say, you know, it's fake because I can see the plastic glue, there, there's something in my mind that's saying, this is real. I can tell that it's physical. Somebody built this. Okay, they yeah. built it at scale, whatever it's it is, there. but it's real. It's physical. I love practical effects. I love model work. And that's one of the reasons I'm glad we're going back to a lot of these 80s TV shows oh, is yeah. that oh, yeah. you get to see the models people built and how much they could do with such small budgets. They do a lot with that. And they... They understand how important a setting is. We only watched a few episodes, but I can already tell the layout of the little production room where the where they've got you know the rows of cubicles with the the stacks of CRTs for people to be able to pound away on typewriters and hack into system. Their keyboards are weird. They did have a lot of fun making technology seem kind of advanced, but totally battered and, and used and in need of replacement. Yeah, and they don't use a room once. They use a room for a couple of bits. They use a room for a couple of scenes. And it means that when they make a model, they get their money's worth out of the model. Even if it's just, we're going to make, like, we're going to flip some pans and I think a trash can over, spray paint them bluish white and put them in the center of the room. And suddenly we have our dangerous cryo room, which is going to kill two of our main characters. <laughs> but at this, yes. and like I can look at that and say, mm, but they they got their money's worth out of it. They got it from a couple of different angles. They had a, you know, they had some smoke effects there. And I said, okay, that's this world. That's what that looks like in this world. And I believed it. And that that does a lot. For the cinematography them. can sell it, and so can the acting. It's. It's 80s TV acting. This is not a pinnacle of the thespian arts, but there are some good performances. They sell these characters. They make them real enough for these stories, and I think everybody in it does a good job. Mm -hmm. it, it, it has a lot of wonderful segments, a lot of wonderful potential, and something that has been lost, and it's wrapped up in a packaging that is odd, and then it's slapped with a bunch of label stickers for something that really is more inconsequential to what the product was. Mm -hmm. Max Headroom is not a good example of what Max Headroom is. Right, yeah. This should be The Adventures of Edison Carter. Mm -hmm. It really should be. So I think we've given you a good idea of what you could expect if you go ahead and watch Max Headroom, the TV series. So now it's time for ratings. Are we going to recommend this to you, and what should happen to this from here? First question on uh, the Intermillennium Project is, binge or no binge? Is this worth going back and watching as a TV series, as a bingeable thing from the world of 2018? What do you think, Ian? Uh, that, I mean, that's hard to say. I think the answer is that yeah, you should go watch it. You should go get bits of this and see. Even if you only see an episode or two, you should go take a look at it just because it has such such a fun aspect to it. But this is not a binge show. This is not a show to sit down and try to watch every episode in a row. And it's purely because I think that you will come out of it, you'll have a lot of something good, but you'll hit some sort of critical dose of the more ridiculous bits that the 80s left in this and a bit too much of a critical dose of the title character 
in such a way that I'm worried it'll taint the cool parts. Okay, so we're off the bat, you're kind of giving us a a midway point between the binge and b- no binge ratings. So you're saying yeah. binge, but re- you know, watch it, but don't watch it all at once. Yeah, binge in small doses. Yeah, you know, check check with your medical professional. <laughs> how, what what dosage of max headroom is right for you? <laughs> if you watch this show for more than four hours, contact your doctor. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I you know I was gonna say binge just because I think it is worth watching. I think it's fun in its own right, and it's a great window on media of its time. But you've got a point. It You'll probably enjoy it more if you don't sit down and try to watch all of it in a weekend, just because it's not the most fast-paced storytelling. It does bog down at times, not such that you want to skip big chunks of it, but you're going to feel like you've put a whole lot of time in for relatively little story if you try to watch more than, say, two or three episodes yeah, in a, in a sitting some... or in a day or in a weekend. It's not pacing. It's not pacing problems. It's just tempo kind of... Yeah. But I would say that it's worth watching the whole thing ultimately because it does a pretty good job of world building. There are elements that they add episode after episode. Uh, they give you a, as much as they need for each story. But then by the end, you're realizing they've created a fairly sophisticated view of the future. Or And of course, like all science fiction, it's a commentary on the, its own time. Mm-hmm. But it is pretty sophisticated by the end, and it's worth watching that build up by watching all the episodes in order. Yeah, watch them in order, watch them, watch them, and I'd, I'd say, like, take it, like, remember who people are, take a note if you want, like, pull up your phone and look them up, because there's a lot of actors in here, which are very cool, they've done other stuff outside of this, but there's also a lot of, this person, you'll meet them in one episode, and they'll come back important in another, if they say, hey, I know a guy who does this, that's the guy who does this, and he'll show up again doing that again. That's where that, you know, give us the action figures of these characters works better. Because, my goodness, if you like you like Reg, you can go get, get a Reg action figure because he'll show up and do his thing again. Yeah. Rick will show up as the guy to get you from A to B and get you the thing no one else is supposed to sell while he's moving you from place to place every time they need him for it and that right there keeps a world consistent and actually makes a world bigger by saying these people are a piece of a bigger world yep and again they do that at a very good pace episode to episode so they really do build it up and if they they take that kind of story bible stuff pretty uh, seriously i can't think of a lot of places where this show contradicts itself and in other episodes they do get into things that are still relevant today they talk about media manipulation of politics and elections and the complicity and coverage of warfare and all kinds of things that even though the media landscape has changed the questions about media ethics and what the relationship is between media and the rest of society uh, those questions are still valid and a max headroom for a sci-fi adventure show goes out of its way to address them yeah it it, it actually ch- tackles large things it tackles still poignant issues it just does so with an odd form of candy coating. And a couple of other casting notes. Mm -hmm. You mentioned, I think you mentioned Jeffrey Tambor. This is probably the first thing I've seen Jeffrey Tambor in, plays Murray, was in uh, Arrested Development, was in the uh, Hellboy movies. Uh, He is terrific. Yeah, voices Glosseric in Star in the Forces of Evil, most recent thing I've heard him in. He's, He's still got that, like, He's he's one of these character actors who has voice as much as what he does. So, yes. so in here he gets to be the the boss character when he when he gets annoyed at Edison, he can play up this like annoyed boss voicing even when he's background calling the calling from another room. Yeah. yeah. He's a good choice for this and that he he's got skills that we see in later stuff, so yeah, he's good in everything that I, I've seen him in, and this is probably the first thing I've seen him in. And he's, he's a lot of his roles they could be two dimensional, they could be caricatures. Certainly, Murray, the producer guy here, could be, but he isn't. Yeah, as you say, there's there's a lot of depth, and Jeffrey Tambor brings that out. And Blank Reg, mm-hmm. you know who plays Blank Reg? No. You know who plays uh, Badger in Firefly and has played so many great bad guys on sci-fi ch- type shows and was the voice of the sci-fi channel for a long time? Maybe he still is. Yeah. That's his dad. That's what I thought you were about to say. <laughs> and that is brilliant. Isn't it? I see it so much now that you say it. And 
Oh yeah. I, I okay. I, that just that just gained this points. Go watch it just to be able to see this happen because it will. See now, now I can't help but imagine a Max Headroom Firefly crossover. <laughs> Give us Max Headroom is like the the world that was from Firefly, oh. and Max escaped up there, and they run into him up there. Just just also hearing Max try to like say shiny and stutter through it. That so Zigzag be... Corporation is acquired by Blue Sun. And exactly, we've there. we've got an entire thing going here now. At this point, I could definitely see Jane as a big time television fan. Oh yeah, all absolutely. day, day after day, making tomorrow seem like yesterday. Oh, Oh, absolutely. Oh, goodness. So I think our uh, our verdict there, our consensus is binge, but don't be in a rush. Right. Definitely go back and watch this, but don't feel like you it's you don't gain anything by watching it all at once. You might gain something by spacing it out a bit. Mm-hmm. So the main question then leads to be the other options. That's right. Our ratings of revive, reboot, or rest in peace. Now, to recap what these ratings mean, revive means should this show get some kind of a revival with its own, with, with its original cast and its original premise, kind of like Twin Peaks has gotten recently and the X Files has gotten recently? Do we want to bring these actors and characters back to say, okay, what's happening to them mm-hmm. decades later? Or reboot, do we want to see a new version of this show, some kind of a reimagining from today's point of view, the way we saw, say, with Battlestar Galactica? And, of course, rest in peace just means just leave it alone, Hollywood. It had its time. It's come and gone. No need to make this again or do anything more with it. So what do you think for uh, Max Headroom? Revive, reboot, or rest in peace? I think the answer is reboot, but I'm going to put an odd caveat on it. Yeah? I say reboot, but don't say you're rebooting it. Give us a reboot. Give us this world. Give us these characters. Give us this story. And do not call it Max Headroom. Give us this world. You can even have AI running in the background that happens to fix everything Deus Ex. Your big season one finale reveal is that it's Max and then everyone loses it on the internet. Give us this show rebooted under a new name where it's just this sci-fi story about journalism and hint at what it's actually the reboot of. I will watch that, and I will be excited when it's revealed what it actually is. But I think that if you were to call it what this is, you're pulling a whole lot of other merchandise. You're pulling a whole lot of other 80s that doesn't need to be pulled in to make this the awesome parts of what it is. So so you like the ideas in this show enough that you want to see it get a fresh start without the Max Headroom goofiness. Uh, and You can even pull in the Max Headroom goofiness towards the end make that your big you know mystery twist that all the, the all the blog posts are talking about for for months give mm-hmm. us give a give your theory bait being that part but don't tie it to the brand i got that i got it so we wouldn't have edison carter or is that enough of a giveaway or is it okay yeah give out edison carter call it the edison carter show people who know will know people who everybody know, else will come people to who it know fresh. will know and people who don't will go wait what and they'll google and they'll be bewildered at what this is i think there's potential there i'm kind of with you on that verdict i think there's a lot in here that's worth revisiting so i wouldn't say rest in peace i'd like to see more done with this revive the future has the the, the, our present has caught up with and surpassed the future that this show was displaying so you really couldn't revive it (laughs) as fun as that might be this sort of retro futurism let's show what 2018 would look like to people who were imagining it from the, the 80s. I think reboot makes a lot of sense. Yeah. But if you're going to reboot a show like this, you understand what kind of show this is. It's a TV show about people making a TV show. Are you saying so, who I think you're saying is director? You know how, who has to reboot this, if anybody. Okay. I'm trying to picture this. I'm trying to picture this as a Sorkin uh, show. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and I'm just a little bewildered by that concept because... There's a plenty of running, there's plenty of walking, and there's plenty of talking. There's not as much simultaneous in what we saw here. There was a lot of run or walk to the place and then talk <laughs> where you are. It's trying to get the walking and the talking to happen at the same time that is throwing me here. Well, when one of your main characters has to be inside a box that's plugged into a 110 or 220 volt current, um, you can't do a lot of walk and talks. Today, <laughs> if you've got Max Headroom on your you know, Galaxy iPhone, uh, your Galaxy Android phone, 
Max Headroom could do a walk and talk, and that's even before we get into the whole VR thing where Max Headroom can be just standing next to you. Dad, you realize you just took Max Headroom and Aaron Sorkin, put them in a blender, and somehow came up with the strangest, most bothersome sequel to the movie Her possible. <laughs> How did you do this strange oh, mathematics? I, you know, you got a point. I think that works. But I, if 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 somebody reboots Max Headroom, I want to see it be Aaron Sorkin. Okay, um, I can I can give that. Although, although that, I think that's another to the Sorkin pile. We might be winding up giving that man a lot of jobs to be working on if we keep this up. I think so. Okay. Well, on that note, I think we've given you an idea of what to expect from Max Headroom. I think it's well worth watching, and it'd be interesting to see if anybody could do anything with it in the future. Yeah. There's potential there, so hopefully. All right. Well, we'll be back soon with uh, more tales of media from the 20th century. Uh, In meanwhile, this is Matthew Porter. And Ian Porter. Thank you for listening to the Intermillennium Media Project, and go find something new to watch.